Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 440, featuring part two of my interview with Annie Vandermeer. Uh, in this segment, we talk some more about visual novels, Renpai, and Twine, uh, before getting into her first, or going back in time to her early days, when she was doing a, a game that was supposed to be a sequel to the uh, De Niro movie Taxi Driver. Uh, so I get to hear that rather weird story. We also talk about her uh, first jobs at Obsidian, the people that she met there, and a little bit about the uh, game based on the Seven Dwarves. So a lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Annie Vandermeer. Well, Annie, I, I see that you were, of all things, an English major <laughs> in college. You probably know I'm in my day job, I'm an English professor. Yes, I've worked with a lot of English majors and people interested in in master's students as well. But people interested in English as a as a career, they don't they don't always know what they want to do <laughs> as a career, right? But they just know they they love reading and writing. And I've, I've had had more than a few that got really interested in games, and they're like, yeah, I like to write for games. Basically, they want to do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what kind of advice would you give somebody like that? You know, you've got strong writing skills, you're great at reading, but how do you turn that into a game design uh, or oh, a game man. development career? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's always a tough one because, like, I mean, I I had always wanted to make games ever since I was, like, a little kid and I was drawing screenshots of the games I was going to do. Um, no idea how to actually put any of that into practice. Like, I was just a kid growing up in suburban Arizona. Not exactly a whole lot of game development companies there in the 80s and 90s. I don't know if there even are now. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I think that the avenue... Just like talking about games getting made, the, the avenue towards getting to a place that makes games is easier now. Um, honestly, I think that the thing that helps for... Uh, writing the most is to understand the medium of games is to like crack open, like start making games now. <laughs> you don't have to wait. There's so many tool sets. There's even small scale stuff like, like twine. That's just about the interactive branching narrative, like get the legwork done and start thinking about the games that you like and what it is about them that you enjoy. Like start thinking about things like mechanics, because even if you just want to be a writer, you don't want to be any of like subclass, like, and I don't mean lower class. I mean like hybridized class, like the narrative designer or just move into design. Um, I'm hybridized at the yin yang. So, you know, it, it's everything is beneficial. And I think that the big thing about games that I keep mentioning is there's a lot of stuff in them. There's there's a ton of different roles. There's a bunch of different elements. And well, I think that can be very daunting to think about initially. Um, like it can be something very encouraging. You have all these potential tools. And even if you don't work on them yourself, knowing a little bit about them and being excited about the collaboration with somebody on that, um, I think is very exciting. Like, even if you do a game by yourself, ostensibly, I did Passenger by myself, but I was standing on, on code that had been written by other people um, and using free sounds and, and music from many people on, on the internet. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say they should just like, jump into making games. Study, study the games that you like. Um, and, uh, yeah, s stick to it. It is not an easy industry to break into and also be forgiving for yourself for, for running into difficulties because it's tough. Um, but, uh, but yeah, make, check your passion, make sure, do you really want to do this? Are you having fun? Mm -hmm. Like, do you feel fulfilled? And if so, like, go for it. I got your back. <laughs> That's good. I was thinking. Maybe somebody that has zero experience making games, you know, they just think everything's got to be done from scratch, not realizing there's actually quite a few things you can pull off the shelf, all these 
all this pre-made assets and a lot of the scripting and you know really it's it's more about uh, i guess what would you call it uh having the determination to just keep going <laughs> <laughs> and to get oh, it, yeah, yeah, stick to it, I think I've heard. It yes, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, stick to itiveness. Uh, <laughs> I don't even remember where that phrase is from, but yeah, that's uh, there's so much out there, and I know that it can feel really overwhelming because it's like you're not just you know finding a tool set or whatever, you are also ostensibly or should connect with a community because what I did was so it was so important to have access to that RenPy community to be like, I am super stuck on this one, guys. Does anybody have any idea about how to do this? It also is like, uh, there's a lot about game development that is a sort of, for as much as I go, oh, it's collaborative, it's collaborative. You're still you at a computer (laughs) working on things or, or sketching things. It can be a very solo experience. And especially doing something, working as a side project or working from home can feel tremendously isolating. So having, seeking out the right community, having people to talk to, I think is enormously important. And I think I, that was just underlined for me even more um, in my time in, in doing indie stuff and talking to other indie developers and like going to the occasional, like meeting up with people at PAX and, and talking about our experiences and be like, you know, you know, <laughs> like, I haven't talked to somebody in a year about oh, this thing. Like, that like, sweet feeling of belonging. Is... <laughs> yeah, it's it's important. It's that having that connection is hugely important, and not just for like, oh, how we solve this problem, but like encouraging each other. It's this pretty key. I remember feeling like that when I first day at college and just being like, you actually like school? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was like the only person in the world like this. Mm-hmm. A couple of things. Now, one thing that occurs to me, we've, we've been talking about RenPy. We mentioned that a few times. I don't know if we've actually said anything about what that is. <laughs> so it occurs to me some people might not even know or have heard <laughs> the word before. But it's actually pretty uh, cool, right? Yeah, it's a really great... Uh, it's it's. I don't know how long PyTom has been working on it, but like I, I've looked back for help and like... I mean, I think it's easily over 10 years. It's a uh, tool that I think the primary function for it, or at the very least the most um, set up for it is visual novels because it is something that uh, handles images and text very easily. It it uses uh, Python or at the very least like a pigeon Python kind of setup. uh, And the scripting for making a basic game is is super easy if you want to get um more into what it can do um uh there's some games out there that have just like cracked it open and just rearranged it christine loves stuff um oh what is it long live the queen which is like really bonkers uh and the team should correct me if i have this wrong but these sometimes always monsters slash always sometimes monsters believe they also use RenPy. Uh, maybe they use RPG Maker. I am so sorry if I get that wrong. But yeah, I know Christy Love has used uh, RenPy and, and you know, there's many other creators out there, so there's lots of examples of it. But it is it is a tool I recommend for people also interested in, in trying to sort of take the next step up from a non-visual interactive narrative to like, and now there are pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's the next step up. It's also like a more comfortable step than like dive right into Unity or Unreal Four. Like it's, it's a nice way to get used to thinking yeah. in that the sort of game construction way before like, oh my god, tools. So. Yeah, that's what I was gonna <laughs> sort of anticipate. One of my my next question was I was wondering like, okay, this this English major we've been talking about. Should they jump right into? Should they go jump right into RenPy, or maybe it's, it's like Twine, a first step, or does think, it matter? I think that I think everybody should take a look at Twine first um, and just noodle with it because you can make stuff so fast, and also because it's a really good way. And actually, the way I've seen Twine used a lot for people is. Um, is as an organizational device. Um, when I worked on uh, Runebound, the Legacy of Dragonhold um, with Fantasy Flight, 
as like a freelance thing, they had been using organization for like um, hyperlinks in a Word document. And I was like, there's, you guys could map this out in Twine. They're like, who the what now? Uh, <laughs> but they were so like happy to run into it. I was happy to use it. And it's, it's, it's a fantastic organizational device. It helps for proof of concept stuff. I, uh, uh, Remy Bouchereau, who's on a, uh, a panel with me, I think that was the real feels one did um did the conversation system or the the i forget the specific name of the system the the um uh, talking about territory about system the party conversation system oh well he did the the system in mafia three oh. um for like talking to your other the other um gang leaders about territory and he mapped everything out as a proof of concept in twine and that when he told me that, it blew my mind. I was like, okay, this is such a helpful tool to just know. Um, and you can carry it with you. So I think I would be like, yeah, get to know Twine first. And then if you like, move on to RenPy. I think that there's so much free stuff out there. To set aside a couple hours to just poke at a thing is like, uh, all it's going to cost you is some time and hard drive space. Like, go for it. Just noodle at anything. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think that's really useful advice about about twine because you know even if even if you do eventually want to move away and learn unity it's nice to know that wasn't just wasted time right you're going to come back you're still going to be using that tool oh yeah i think that i think an important thing actually and that i i love underlining in in game development and learning about games and in just i think just studying stuff is there's really no such thing as wasted time i think a lot of people tend to think in terms of like productivity and if you look at like pre-production of a game it can be kind of daunting because you're like i didn't i didn't do anything today um but you know your your sort of list of things that you actually looked at or thought about and did is just you know a page long it's we are very i think keyed into looking at at output and like tying stuff very immediately to a sort of sequence of events, but it's like, and I, I've had to tell junior designers who have this sort of worry that they want to put everything in the game right now. They have all these ideas. It's like, baby, no, no, no. Put that in your back pocket. You'll have time. Like, it's okay. It's okay. You'll have time. Like, and the things that you work on now that maybe don't come to fruition, you can bring back later. Like nothing's lost. Especially if you write it down and keep a million notebooks like I do that are like arrayed behind me. So. I don't think I've had a single designer developer on the show that hasn't at some point told a story where they had all these great ideas and they wanted to put into a game and just for logical constraints, I guess, or something happened and they weren't able to put it in. And, you know, they always yeah. get this sort of wistful, like, oh, you know, this game would have been so great if I just could have done this. And, ah. Oh, yeah. It must be yeah. hard to live with just that kind of <laughs> regret, even though like these masterpiece games, everybody loves. And then like, you know, you could tell though they're in their mind. It was like, it's not the game. Yeah. I, I didn't get to put in. <laughs> nothing's ever done. Nothing's ever done. We all have the game that we wanted to make up here. And it's just like, if we can get 50% of that out to people in the way, in about 80% of the way that we wanted it, like that is a win, but oh, I have all this other stuff. <laughs> It could have been so great. <laughs> Are you ready to uh, go back in time? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about your early days in the industry. And I noticed there's some discussion about a game that's based on the movie Taxi Driver. <laughs> yeah, that I'm was like, my... what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really? everybody's reaction. Like, Taxi the... Driver, okay. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody's first question is why? Uh, <laughs> and um, I mean, that was my very first game. And uh, if, I don't know if Majesco is still around anymore, but one of the things that they did is that sort of led to this game being a thing was that they figured out, they got tech to put um, cartoons on uh, Game Boy Advance cartridges. And for a while that was printing money. Because uh, everybody had a GBA, and like parents could just buy a little thing, and like kids could just watch stuff on their GBA. Um, so flush with cash, uh, they bought a bunch of movie licenses. They actually, I think it was Appaloosa Interactive. I 
think those are the guys who did the Echo the Dolphin games, and they were like, do a Jaws game! We have the license! <laughs> like, forget non-violence, have a giant shark! Uh, and so, uh, Papaya Studio, where I was working, and this was predates my time there, um, had been throwing out a couple different concepts, and one just vaguely involved taxis, and they're like, oh, do taxi driver! And I was like, okay, we'll have some Hollywood writers work on it. Um, which was so much the catchphrase of like 2006 like hollywood writers not even 2006 sorry 2004 hollywood writers hollywood writers um so i came in as a jack of all trades on that game and like did anything that was needed essentially and we were waiting for a script and waiting for a script and waiting for a script and it never arrived so it was like hey annie you haven't you know english major creative writing background like you want to take a crack at it and so I watched the hell out of Taxi Driver. It's a good movie. I, it's a great movie. It's, it's a great Classic. movie. And I sunk myself into it. And I did so much that I was like, I have not watched it since. Uh, because I, <laughs> I really it's invested in trying it. to just do it justice and do this right. And, um, and then like one of the other designers would just roll in on the bark strings and have one of the enemies yell yeah i'm talking to you and i was like he says that to himself alone in his room like stop and you had a little writer fit about it um <laughs> so it was it was quite the game to to cut my teeth on and to i mean and it was also another thing showing it at you know the first e3 2005 the first e3 where i showed anything and being like i hope people don't stab me in the eye because i'm making this game like just out of like frustration like this should not be but uh yeah that... so somebody just looked at the titles like taxi driver oh it's about a guy <laughs> drives taxis that'll be a great game you know crazy taxi uh. <laughs> yeah everybody tried like when they first heard about it, they were like wait no like crazy taxi and i was like no <laughs> like, the movie. like it's essentially a sequel to the movie and they're like why would you do that and be like not my job <laughs> yeah that's not an my... interesting I, so it's like a, it's supposed to be a sequel to the movie yeah, essentially it was. And it was, um, I mean, it's, <laughs> what do you do when you have a movie that is, a, a, follows a super anti-hero who, who does something heroic despite himself? And then like, now you're this hero of <laughs> this game. It was something that I tried to put a lot of um, nuance in, and I probably overworked it a bunch because I was baby designer and writing my first thing and, oh my gosh, I'm writing a game. Uh, and there was actually one point where they tried to go, and this was an alpha. So guys, what if we weren't doing Taxi Driver? And having to, I had two days to completely rework everything in the script. Uh, and I went completely insane for those two days, but I, I did it. And that's still an achievement of mine that I'm like, did not totally lose my mind doing this thing. But then like a week later, they're like, yeah, never mind, it's Taxi Driver again. <laughs> I'm game trying development. To, I'm trying to think of a more difficult game to be handed. You know, and say, hey, make a game out of this, you know. I guess something like Citizen Kane, maybe that would be. Yeah. Just letting <laughs> mini game. Let's just take these great classic movies and Oh yeah. You know, I Some... guess it worked it was fine back in the like the Atari days when the game didn't have to resemble in any <laughs> former fashion. I'm just I think that there should be a site or something that's just like games that looks at those classic games uh and I say classic just because they're old not because they're memorable uh and be like which one was the least like the movie like Blues Brothers maybe <laughs> where I think there's aliens I don't know like the ludicrousness of those games from back in the day uh I think it's really funny but when you're working on one and you're like oh god especially when it's a movie I've, I fundamentally really liked um and the other weird thing that I found out when I was working on it is that one of my dad's good friends from college was the guy who wrote it Paul Schrader I was like what okay that's really weird please don't tell him what I'm working on <laughs> You may be upset. That was you. <laughs> no, yeah. That was a very, very interesting uh, first game to cut my teeth on. Uh, and I think it taught me a lot of important lessons about design, such as sometimes keep things in one medium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I remember talking to David Crane one time. And who was it? Steve Cartwright. But anyway, they did the, the Ghostbusters game back on the way back, you know, that old 
I think I got a copy of it up there somewhere, like 85 oh. or so. <laughs> uh, but I remember one of the things was they had never seen the movie. They had no idea what it was about. Oh, gosh. And I guess they had like a picture of the car and stuff. <laughs> Some photos to work from. But, you know, looking back, I'm like, that was actually a good game. You know, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known. It seems to, you know, if you think about it, yeah, some of the stuff in the game doesn't really fit the movie at all. <laughs> I unironically love the Willow game for yeah. the Nintendo. It's a super good game. It's a nice little RPG. Like it made rose-colored glasses in a bit, but like, yeah, if you have a legitimate way to play it and not an emulator, um, you should check it out. <laughs> Like, and that, there's an ocarina and a pterodactyl in it, and I don't remember those from Willow the Movie, but, like, cool, it was a good addition. It works. Rounded out the world somewhere, I guess. <laughs> what was that movie that came out not too long ago? And I think it had Vin Diesel, maybe? But everybody was saying the game is so much better than the movie. Oh, yeah. That's happened right. a few times, I'm sure. I always love it when that happens, because it's so... <laughs> That's great, you know, for what? Yeah. Have a weird little reversal. <laughs> All right, so that brings us up to about 2006. And you're working on a project there for Obsidian. This is Obsidian time. Mm -hmm. And a project called Project New Jersey. Yep. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that uh, Project New Jersey and then maybe also uh, how you ended up at Obsidian. So I had super wanted to to go to obsidian for a while and um when it was looking like uh taxi driver was going to get canceled and whatnot they had a i think it was a writer designer position open and i had the whole am i good enough should i and just like okay just go for it and i applied for it um and Apparently, I didn't have the sort of background to get hired for that one, but they liked my application and my interview enough that I got brought on as a production design assistant, which is basically just like a almost junior designer. Um, and because uh, I don't think that was such an invented title, I still don't yeah. even know the sort production of production design assistant. Assistant. PDA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I got I got brought on to to work on Project New Jersey, which I don't think I'm breaking any NDAs that haven't already been broken to say it was a game called Dwarfs, um, and Dwarfs, not Dwarves, because apparently Dwarves was copyrighted or something. But yeah, Dwarfs. Um, dwarfs. Yes, Dwarfs. Uh, and that was the first time I got to work with. Um, I think that Josh Sawyer was the lead combat designer on there. Uh, Brian Minnesota was doing the story and it actually had some really interesting mechanics to it that I I was, I think I think everybody working on that game was like, this is going to be great there's so much about this that's good and two months into my time there the game got cancelled uh... and like, I think every developer maybe less now, because I think Games are either getting canned now earlier or um, they're going to they come out more often. I don't know what it is, but I, the younger developers that I've worked with have, I guess, better better kill rates for getting games out, I guess. Um, but I think a lot of devs have the one that got away. Mm -hmm. um, the, like, it could have been so great, the, the vision in my head. And, like, Dwarfs is still that for me. And I, I would be shocked if it wasn't for, for anybody else who worked on it. But how um, far along was it? It was a year into pre-production. Like a a good level had been done. Like concepts had done been done for the characters. The the story was sort of set down, and it was also uh, a UE three game. Sorry, Unreal three. Um, when Unreal was just in its infancy, um, I should say Unreal three specifically because uh, they didn't have tutorials for how to make anything on Unreal 3, so they were like, uh, try to do some tutorials for Unreal 2, which is totally different. It's like, you make levels in Unreal 2 by, like, subtracting, and, like, 3 was adding, so it was kind of not... Learn French by learning Spanish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it wasn't a waste of time, but it was not immediately helpful. So, uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting experience. I did stuff like, uh, help design a level, and, um, did things like uh, 
work on the the ambient life system. And I got to work with Brian Hines on that, uh, who's an awesome designer. I think he's back at Obsidian right now. And he actually did the ambient life system for Bully. Uh, at, so it was really awesome to, to learn from him and hear about his experiences in that. Like those two months, my first time at Obsidian was, I spent so much time in other people's offices just, ch- just chattering at them and wanting to learn uh, what they'd worked on and what they could teach me and everything that I had to get shooed out and like, Annie, come on, <laughs> don't with that. Like, Love keep that totally down on hours. Like, more than once, I will admit. I was just super excited to be there and, and working on a thing that I liked. Oh my god. Nobody's gonna stab me in the eye for this game. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about some of the people I've had on this show that you probably were there. They were there probably while you were there. You know, mm-hmm. Chris Avalon. George Zeiss, of course, you know, you know, thanks to George, by the way, for helping me uh, <laughs> contact yeah. you for this interview. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned Josh already. Uh, Fergus mm-hmm. uh, has been on. And that's just a few that I was, you know, quickly scanned. And I just kind of like, what was it? What were these uh, folks like? I mean, were they nice to work with? Oh, no- oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had uh, I had a good experience in my time at Obsidian. Like I I. I did a lot of crunch. There was a lot of crunch uh, on on stuff, and I Long think it was. Hours. Oh yeah, I I I will admit to you that I wrote a lot of Storm of Zaheer in like a fugue state. <laughs> I was there to like nine or ten almost every time I I went in on the weekends to write stuff for for Alpha Protocol. Like it was as a part of the culture, and um and I know that they worked to change it, but it was also a sort of thing that was not at all uncommon in in the industry at the time um i i threw myself a little pity party about storm of zaheer taking you know nine months to make and then i started working at at um arena net and uh my friend Lindsay was like oh yeah we did the nightfall expansion in six months and i was like i'm gonna stop feeling sorry for myself <laughs> holy crap uh but yeah like it, it wasn't uncommon, but it was it was really fantastic to work with really inspiring people. It was this sort of um, span of time in which I got to work on a bunch of cool things with a bunch of really awesome people. And I got to do ludicrous things in the way that you can do ludicrous things when you're in your 20s by being like, I worked on three games in one day, like this and then this project, and then I helped on this one. No, you shouldn't do that. That's not a healthy developer thing. But I did it, and I loved it, and it was perfect for the time. So well, that sounds great. I was reading. I think it was maybe a Stan Lee, one of his reprints of one of his bullpen bulletins. I could be wrong about that, but uh, they were talking about how the the artists in in the comics industry were very helpful to other artists. Maybe it was the Jason Aaron in his love. Uh, he's just left the Thor series. I thought that that was great. You know, he's talking about how the artists don't feel like they're really, even though I guess technically they're in competition with these other artists, uh, but they're very open. They're very, they want to basically help you. Yeah. Uh, to reach that level. You know, would you say it's yeah. sort of similar in games? I, I think so. I think that, I think that one of the things about the industry, and I do you know, use this term and it's always true. It's, it's incestuous. Everybody has worked with everybody else. And uh, it is, in a very self-serving way, like beneficial to, to help somebody else to make sure they know what's going on because then you can know that they have your back. But it's also just, it is, it's fun to, to work with people. And like, if you have an opportunity to do mentoring, like I mentored, uh, uh, Lana Chappelle when we were both at arena net and she has so far surpassed me now in everything she does. Um, but it, it, it's a good thing. And I think it's also one of those things of being in a creative medium where being a prima donna about it will not help you. We are all in this together. Like if you are, if you sort of lockstep about the one thing that you're doing and you don't help others, that doesn't help the game. You've, you've lost sight of what it is that you're doing. Like collaborative medium, help other people. It just makes sense. Also, you're probably gonna if you even if you leave this company, the odds are you you very well might be working with that uh, person again yeah. somewhere else. So be nice. Yeah, you just run up <laughs> occasionally. You run up against issues with like you want to talk to this person, but there's some kind of NDA, 
non-disclosure agreements kind of legal you know mumbo jumbo do you run into that sometimes and oh yeah deal with that? i think that to be totally honest and i know this, <laughs> this is off like, the record but... <laughs> yeah i oh. mean there's there's a term called friend da <laughs> friend da That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week. We'll see with the uh, third part of my interview. We'll see how it goes. As I told you before, it's kind of uh, hit or miss here these days with the uh, semester and the teaching load. <laughs> you know, I can't make any guarantees, but I will try my best to get the episodes out in due time. And as always, I want to thank you, uh, you in particular, for your role in making these episodes happen. Uh, for doing your part really means a lot to me. Uh, anything that you do to support the show, whether that be going into that lovely Patreon link, just clicking the button, getting it done, you know, a buck a show, that's all I ask. So please go check that out. But, uh, you know, also tweeting about the episodes, Facebook, uh, <laughs> Facebooking, <laughs> Facebookering. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, heck, there's probably people Instagramming <laughs> this show. <laughs> Uh, but the point is, whatever you do uh, to support this show, I appreciate it. So thank you uh, very sincerely for that. That said, what about that news from the Matt Cave? So, uh, just some exciting stuff here today. Uh, I don't even know where to start with this. I might just have to go by the list that I wrote before the show. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alcat Games has launched a Kickstarter for Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. 30 days left to go on this, and they were trying to raise a paltry 300 grand. And they have only made it to 842k. Uh, <laughs> they say 300 grand, I'm at 300,000. Uh, or does that mean? Anyway, they're trying to reach 300,000. They've already reached 842,000 in less than a day, as far as I can tell. Now, they've got over 14k backers, and it was kind of fun. I was sitting there as I was making my pledge. Uh, I could see the numbers just going up by like tens, uh, just every few seconds. Incredible stuff. Uh, this is the sequel, or is it a sequel? I don't know. Embark on a journey to a realm overrun by demons and rise to power by choosing one of six available mythic paths. Master their abilities and change the world around you as an angel, a lich, a trickster, an aeon, a demon, or an azata. Each mythic path leads to unique skills and appearances and greatly impacts the game's story. Now, that's a thing we've heard before, isn't it? Let's see, Pathfinder, first edition rule set. Uh, Ten races, 21 classes, over a thousand. Uh, spells, feats, abilities, and a strategy layer that kind of ticks it over into a, uh, as a kind of a troop control movement, uh, uh, troop control uh, game. <laughs> what am I trying to say here? And so instead of controlling your individual party members, you're kind of in control of a small army, sounds like. Uh, ten companions, multiple romance options, because I guess that's what <laughs> a lot of people uh, long for. Uh, 360 degree rotating camera. That's probably more. I'm probably more excited about that. Let's see. Anyway, I just went ahead and backed this thing. I, I know some people were not too happy with the first game. I don't know what they're talking about. I had a great time with it. Uh, it's 55 bucks to get the one uh, to get the version with a box, cardboard box. <laughs> which I think is going to look pretty awesome up there. Uh, physical manuals, and uh, you get a credit in the game. I didn't see any mention of a cloth map, so maybe they're bucking a tradition a little bit uh, by omitting that. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, I'd, probably my favorite thing, I like to get the printed manuals in the box just to have on display here. Uh, it's kind of nice, I think, to have a little poster or something, or a card that's signed. You know, there's, there's little things you can put in there that doesn't they don't cost too much but add a little bit of, uh, you know, incentive to collect. But anyway, uh, that is Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. 
All right, second up, uh, this is uh, maybe even as cool as that in its own way. This is Hired Sword 2, the latest uh, CRPG to come out from Double Sided Games. Tells the story of a mercenary who, after squandering all his coin and libations, has fallen in love with a seductive elf with long, flowing hair. The problem is, uh, she's gone missing. Isn't that the way it always goes? And your quest is to find her however dangerous it may be. Now, this game features racy, racy, <laughs> and fun uh, storytelling. I'm not really sure how racy it gets. So, you look at the cover of this thing, it's a little bit racy. You know, I don't know <laughs> what you can really <laughs> expect to see. But then again, you know, you could, you could go back and look at it. What was it? Samantha Fox uh, strip poker on the Commodore 64. Uh, rather explicit, so I don't know if it's going to go to that level or not. We'll see. Uh, anyway, 20 maps to explore, including 9 dungeons, 36 types of monsters, weapons, armor, randomly generated through 1,000 combinations. You can pre-order this for CAD, which I had to look that up. Apparently means Canadian dollars. That's uh, $12.99 or $49.99 in Canadian dollars to get the digital or the physical box respectively and they do throw in the cloth map uh how that uh, you know how you do the currency conversion looks like it's a little cheaper than it sounds at least as far as i was able to tell so it's 50 bucks canadian money i think that works out maybe like 42 uh, dollars in american dollars but again you should check this out because <laughs> i don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> Uh, okay, to wrap up, we've got Game Banshee's Val H back in the news again. Or back uh, reporting uh, the news, and here I am reporting on the reporting. Uh, that's what we've, that's the kind of high journalistic standards you've come to expect here from Matt Chat. Anyway, if you're up for some really old school role playing, and who isn't really, direct your attention to GOG.com, where you can now pick up The Lords of Midnight and its sequel. Doom Dark's Revenge. These are a couple of Mike Singleton's games from the 1980s. They're a co combination or a hybrid of strategy RPG. Kind of not, not too dissimilar to what Pathfinder's up to these days. Uh, the Lords of uh, Midnight, not simply an adventure game nor a war game. It is really a new type to become known as an epic game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, epic games. That's a, that's a thing. Uh, you play the Lords of Midnight. Uh, you'll be writing a new chapter. You'll guide individual characters across the land of midnight on vital quests, but also command armies. You must endeavor to hold back the foul hordes of Doom Dark, the Witch King. My friends, all that is old is new again. Yours will be no inevitable victory. Anyway, it's, it's free. Uh, who knows how long it will be free, though? So I would just say pop over there to Gog. If you got any interest in this whatsoever, go ahead and add it to the library to your shelf, and then you'll have it, you know, in case you want to play it later. It's the 1984 story-based adventure complete with novella. Easy dip-in, dip-out, turn-based game play. Anyway, <laughs> I think that will do it for the news. Now, what about that quotation? Looking for quotes about novels and writing fiction and things of that sort, and I came across one by one of my favorite authors, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who, of course, did the uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, stories. It's really a lot of fun. You should definitely check him out. You know, some of the stuff in the stories rarely shows up in the, in the TV shows and the movies, so it's kind of fun. You know, I didn't even know that Tom Baker had done a little stint as <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. I <laughs> uh, got that on my, I think that's on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Anyway, it's in the queue. I have to let you know how that goes. Uh, anyway, here's the quote. The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. So ponder on that and see you next time.
Her power has enchanted me. I stand helpless against it. Come to me now. Tonight, let me worship you in my arms. 